Alright. Hello. We're getting started. Right on time. About a minute early. Whew. We get the wiggles out here. How's everybody doing? We're getting back to painting tonight. We're gonna do a landscape painting. Um, this landscape painting is from a reference that you'll see in the thumbnail of this video. And you'll see it as the painting emerges. The photo is a, a photo that I took. A the photo was a photo I took. <laughs> it's a photo I took. It's the reference in Yellowstone a few years ago. Similar to my other landscape paintings. Uh, this time I edited the source photo. The purpose of editing this photo was to create more dramatic effect. And the edited photo kind of looks a little wacky. You might be able to see that in the in the thumbnail, just at some of the edges and like the clouds and stuff, but I was just trying to help some of the color come through. And uh, most importantly, the, the values. So uh, a little while back, James Gurney released a YouTube video. I mean, it might have been a while ago, but a little while back, I saw that I saw a video by James Gurney, the painter, the illustrator, where he was talking about painting landscapes and how to create an artificial light, uh, an artificial area of focus. So you, you paint everything at kind of a lower value, except for a specific part of the painting where you can make the sun kind of like just pop through the clouds and it makes sense to our eyes because you know that happens all the time you have clouds above and the sun kind of pops through so for this reference for this uh, landscape I have brightened the hill and the I've just kind of adjusted the values, but I feel like the overall composition is really nice. Uh, I've, I've cut out this piece of hard word from, a, from another canvas. I ripped off the old painting, <laughs> and uh, I still have the, the linen, and so the, the painting is not damaged. But I was able to, to pull it off and uh, reuse this hard board. And this is uh, double oil primed linen. Today, we're going to be toning the canvas and doing the monochrome underpainting. If we're feeling bold, we could move on to color, but that will most likely happen tomorrow. Let me check uh, these hotkeys here. All right, nice. So as we, uh, as we hit each stage, I'm gonna hit a check mark and uh, We'll know if anybody comes in. We'll know which stage we're at. Right now, nothing's out. So it should be pretty obvious. But the toning should happen pretty fast, so let's get that started. I'm also gonna run a fan, which uh, is not gonna be convenient for the sound, but I think uh, ventilation is important while we're using solvents like this. So the, the toning that we're gonna do, as you can see on the screen here, it's gonna be burnt umber. Um, I think I might mix in a tad bit of alizarin crimson. It has a lot of tinting strength against burnt umber. Um, that way it's a little bit more reddish. You can kind of see it in the reference here. There's kind of some reds that pokes out barely. It kind of pushes more towards red. Burnt umber is already reddish, but if I add a little bit of alizarin crimson, uh, we have some that kind of dried up here. The only fresh paint that I have on the palette right now is burnt umber. These are all from a week ago, the last painting. Um, so I'm gonna try to work with what I have there. But I mean, if it's if it's dried too much, if these uh, piles have dried too much, then I'll pour new paint. But I'll have to worry about that tomorrow. That's why I only uh, poured burnt umber for now. And the uh, lizard crimson is still pretty wet, so even after a week. Whew, suction cup there. It's been a little while since we painted. <laughs> so I have a I have a hardware store brush, 
cheap hardware store brush. I'm gonna dip it in the solvent. All right. And actually, I'm gonna run the fan right now. And like I said, it's gonna be a little bit uh, obnoxious. But we have the music too, and hopefully those kind of, it's kind of white, it's like white noise. So the fan will be on for a little bit, uh, just while this uh, first layer dries. So pardon the noise for the like next 15 minutes, maybe longer. But now I have a dynamic microphone, which should make it better, easier to hear me with the fan. Okay, so. I've dipped this in the Gamsol. So this has a little bit of Gamsol on the end of the brush. I'm just gonna mix into this uh, burnt umber here and a little bit of alizarin crimson right next to it, like we planned. All right. I didn't test to see how this would sound, but honestly, oh, whatever. I'm gonna get a little bit more Gamsol here. Uh, if you're just skipping ahead now, uh, I just mentioned this a minute ago, but we're running the fan, so there's going to be some background noise for this part until the, we kind of let the toning layer uh, dry up a little bit. I guess we're going to use quite a bit of uh, odorless mineral spirits for this part. You can see I'm getting it very, very thin. You can see my reflection there. Hi. <laughs> you can see my face on the... Uh, the palette. I didn't notice that. I haven't had it at this uh, angle. Hello. There I am. Okay, maybe a little bit more alizarin. Uh, there's a touch of cad red light in there. That's fine. Okay. I'd say that's probably probably use a little bit more solvent. Get it very drippy. We just want to cover the whole canvas. Like I said, I have a fan running. If you're doing this at home, make sure you have ventilation. You have uh, windows open, or you're doing this in open, more of an open air setting. If you're using odorless mineral spirits, or a turpentine, or any type of solvent. That includes alkyds like liquid and stuff like that. I try to make sure it's ventilated and I run a fan while I'm using certain stuff. Um, it's been harder to do that with stream, so I do that like during breaks and when I can mute the mic and then like before and after painting, I'll, I'll run the fan a lot of the time. Anytime I'm cleaning my brushes, I'm running the fan. I, I open windows, I vent out this room, but I have, a, I have a, a fan that creates negative pressure in here. There's airflow that pretty much takes It, it's forces all this air out of there this way out of the room uh, ideally I'd like to have a fume hood but like that's kind of like <laughs> for painting that's like way overkill uh, you know I'm not looking to open a restaurant in my little office studio All right, so we're just making sure we cover everything here. Like I said, this is burnt umber and alizarin crimson. Making sure we have pigment all over the uh, canvas. And as we wipe this back, we'll see a little bit more of the red of the alizarin crimson. And it'll even out too, because we're gonna be covering a big layer. All right, so we'll close that up. get my gloves on here and uh, clean this brush. Since it has a lot of solvent and it, it'll dry pretty quick. So I just want to clean it right now. So it's not going to be this dark. We're going to wipe it down. And uh, since it's double oil primed, it won't soak in. It kind of just sits on top of it. It is linen, so even though it has uh, double oil prime, there are little nooks and crannies that the pigment gets stuck into. 
And uh, again, if you're just like skipping ahead or just like listening to it now, uh, the fan in the background is kind of a necessity right now as we keep this ventilated. This uh, hardware store brush barely fits in this brush, in this uh, brush agitator, brush washer, brush washer, solvent holder. clean enough. It's not totally clean, but it's clean enough. I'm going to set that next to the fan. Close this up. We get some paper towels. Two. Layered on top of each other, folded in half. So we have four layers here. And as I'm moving my hand around, I'm not gonna be lifting up my hand off. Cause if I do that and then I reposition my fingers, it's gonna start soaking it up again. We wanna kinda, after I start moving this around, it's gonna start spreading it around instead of soaking it up. So it's just kind of a nice way to be able to soak up just a little bit at a time and evenly spread out the pigment throughout the, uh, the canvas. So even pressure on each layer without lifting up or moving my hand around. You can see I'm not really getting any lighter by staying right here. It gets just barely lighter, but for the most part, if we're doing wide strokes like this, which is what I really want to be doing, wide strokes, I'm picked up a little bit of it picking up uh, a little bit of the excess on this first layer here but for the most part we're just spreading it around and I'm cutting off pieces of the paper towel too with the sharp edges of this canvas so I just lifted up my fingers there and now it's picking up a little bit more let me stand up for this All right, so you can see there, it's very well saturated. I'm starting to wear down that first layer. So I'm gonna fold it this way and then hold it on this side and just do the same thing again. You'll see it, get, it gets lighter, but the, uh, at a certain point, it's not gonna get any lighter. Just It's just gonna get like a value shade lighter, which is gonna be what we're looking for like this. Looks like there's a defect on this this roll here that I didn't see. It's tiny. That'll be fine. Paint it over. Defects are good. Nothing's perfect. All right, so there we go. We now have a toned canvas. Let me go ahead and hit that check mark. It's done. We're now moving on to the monochrome underpainting. So I'm gonna kinda I'm gonna clean this up a little bit. Scoop this up. This palette knife's very uneven. Just gonna wipe it up.
Uh, and this rag I'm going to keep out next to the fan too while we run it for the next few minutes. And then uh, we're going to just start laying out some major landmarks and some values here for the underpainting. Uh, actually, I think I might want to wipe away the hill first, so I'll do that. So I'm going to get a fresh paper towel here. And I have my reference to the exact same size. I actually cut this to match the size of my monitor. Uh, the exact same aspect ratio. So let me just take a measurement just to keep things tidy just for these uh, major landmarks. I'm gonna have to flip it around. There we go. It's really wet, so I can just use my uh, finger to mark that. Let me measure it from the top. Okay, that's good. And it goes down to here, about right there. That's about the same height. Okay, so I'll just try to, I think I can just estimate it from here. The hill is the most important part. I just wanna get the top part here. That goes down, so you have the tree. We have this kind of channel right there. Um, a lot of pressure and a new spot against this oil prime linen. Actually, when it's this wet, you can remove quite a bit. And this is something I practiced a lot with the monochrome underpaintings or monochrome sketches that I did for portraits for a while. I did a couple dozen of those in a row. And it really got me familiar with this surface. Uh, again, I'm running the fan right now, so apologies for that. It'll just be a few more minutes. Got to secure the easel here. When I meant pressure, I really meant it. Like, <laughs> this is going to be the brightest part. And be good to remove as much pigment as we can to kind of reveal that oil primed white surface underneath. It's going to be brightest at the top right here, so I want to make sure I'm removing as much as I can. I mean, we're not going to get the values exactly right, but this is the brightest of the bright in the whole painting. All right. So just very rough blocking in. these that come in like that and like that we'll make adjustments I 
I'll add some pigment back on since we have a little bit on the palette still for these areas. Just lightly kind of darken it without overworking it. There we go. A little bit of finger painting. We're going to use whatever tools we can. I think it's Richard Schmid that said that in his uh, Alla Prima book. All right, I'm going to turn this off. There we go. That should be much more tolerable. Sorry about that, but it's necessary for this uh, painting. It's a larger canvas with a lot of solvent. some brighter parts right here we'll focus on the really bright stuff as we go on but there's there's a lot to really pull out in this so I'm, I'm kind of excited all right so the top of the skyline the horizon well it's really at the top of the mountain range the horizon is a little bit lower starts about right here kind of cascades a little bit works its way down to there ever so slightly All right, let's continue with this. This can be a little bit darker. And then uh, in a minute here, I'm gonna grab a brush and start blocking some stuff in, some major uh, values. Kind of like what we're doing here, but we're subtracting right now. to be as bright as down here. I'm going to follow the reference pretty closely, but I'm going to be making some small adjustments as we go. Keep what I like, make up some stuff, but still stick to the reference. So the top of this range is kind of like that. It's by like this. It's down right there. This is a tad bit brighter right there. And so is this. and we're gonna work our way up. So obviously this kind of vignettes, we 
we have some very dark values, but I want to actually kind of rough in where the trees are and stuff like that. Dip that in. We're going to take some of this alizarin crimson or uh, burnt umber. It's very, very wet, which is good. We want this uh, first layer to be very thin. And a touch of alizarin crimson. And I'm not mixing this very efficiently, kind of all over, but I think it's okay for the underpainting as long as we get the values right. Okay. Starting from the darkest, go to the bottom here. And I'm just going to rough in some major groups I'm seeing. I'm going to uh, squint my eyes. It's very dark right here. There's a shape right there and a little tree that pops out. A couple little trees. Like that. You can see the trunk kind of pop out right there. And then we have some dark shadows right here. Very dark shadows under these branches. And we're just gonna kind of work our way back and forth. have these trees out here and I'm gonna make stuff I'm gonna make very dark marks at first and then I'm gonna I need a smaller brush for this should have done that before work that trunk there that's all right usually uh, try to get the biggest brush for the job. Move to this one. I went a little too big there. So I want this to be perfectly straight like that. And kind of curves out like that. And of course there's a tree right here. We're gonna try to follow the reference pretty closely for all of these features trees I want this range in the background for both of these to be pretty flat so I'm gonna do probably gonna do minimal underpainting but we'll see we have this tree here down over here. I'm just going to be jumping all over the place for a little bit. We have this cool feature, right? Here. Move it a little bit. It's very dark. Okay. Actually, let's splash out this whole area and then we'll move we'll move from left to right. This trunk that pops out. I'm gonna use a synthetic brush. I think this will be easier. A better flow. This tree that kind of comes out like that. Again, I'll go dark and then uh, we'll brighten it up with uh, Q-tips, paper towels, and stuff like that. Actually, let me mass in some more major value shapes. Let's not stress the details quite yet. 
let me just make sure we're getting the bigger shapes and then we'll lighten it up. So we'll go dark first. We're gonna save ourselves some time. And then we'll be subtractive. There's um, this tree here. So I don't have all the features quite in the right place, but I think it's pretty similar. All of the features are there and contributing to the composition in a way that seems right. Actually gonna try to keep these struck these uh well no we won't keep it vertical we'll keep it abstract i just want to mass in these big shapes it's the most important thing right now All right, so we can see, we can already start to see the value composition here, um, even without the, the whole reference being visible and uh, kind of why I chose this this painting and, and pushed the values a bit uh, when I edited, it, edited the photo. I didn't change, all I did was crop the image and then brighten the values here and then tried to make the, tried to make the clouds a little bit more chromatic but it's not, that's not gonna be exactly what it's gonna look like. The values are gonna be the same for all of it. And the colors for the sky are not gonna be exactly like they look in the reference. All right, so I'm gonna come back through here too and touch up certain stuff. We'll subtract and then I'll make some stuff darker too. I feel like we can shift the values a little bit for this underpainting, but again, I don't want to overwork it. We're not going to stress a lot of the details. Just want to make sure all the features are here and the composition is right. And the value structure is right in conjunction with the composition. that. So like that. These, all of these trees on this hill in here, they're going to be the darkest thing since they're vertical. Generally with uh, the sun overhead or somewhat overhead, general rule of thumb is things that are vertical are darkest because there's no, the sunlight is not hitting it directly. So as a general rule of thumb, that's that's good to follow. And then what's what usually is brightest, and there's exceptions, of course, with like in in different types of settings. But generally, uh, when you're looking at places uh, that aren't unusual, like where land meets water and stuff like that, the value structure is the brightest place is where the sun hits the ground. Obviously, it doesn't apply for the ocean, or at least for all of it, just for like the peaks that come out, but. Anyway, think about how the light the light works here, and the value structure supports that. It helps this this hill kind of pop out. We have um, we have the mountains in the back, which are going to be desaturated because we have all that atmosphere between our eyes, or at least the camera in this case, and those mountains. But we're going to recreate that in the painting, <laughs> and 
establishing this value structure during the underpainting is going to help with that a lot. It helps with portrait paintings and it will help with landscape painting as well. Because we can, we can sort a lot of these big things out now and then when we come back on the second layer and start laying down full color and mixing color as we block it in, we don't have to stress about where we're putting stuff or, and we, and it's going to make it easier for us to make sure our values are correct. We're working within our, the value structure of the whole painting. Because value is key. We can adjust the colors as much as we want. You know, I'm going to, I, I want to make sure that I, I let a little bit of red come through right here. And I'm hoping that I remember that, but it, it can't be that much because these mountains behind going to be desaturated. You know, on getting this underpainting done so fast, we might be able to get this done tonight. Let's see, 37 minutes. Yeah, you know, we might try color tonight, at least a portion of it. Definitely won't stop the underpainting, I don't think, at the pace we're going at. All right, so I'm gonna lighten a lot of this up, but I'm adding these details here. And before I forget, I'm just gonna use a paper towel to kind of lighten all this up. We don't want this to be as dark as down here, but we don't want it to be as bright as here, so we don't wanna lighten it up too much. So we kinda of wanna add these features working within the value range of that section of the painting. We don't have to worry about saturation yet, but the saturation is going to work in conjunction with this not going to be shifting much in value range, even though we have these details. Um, the value range shift is not going to be nearly as, the contrast isn't going to be nearly as crazy back here as it is for this. The hill and the trees are going to create the major like contrast and all everything kind of leads you know it's just boom the hill's just out there in fact we can kind of round it off it's looking like a pyramid right now I think it goes a little bit over this way there we go all right so I'm just gonna go back and forth here and add details as we go we have these trees which are close by so those will be dark too they're just right on the other side of this hill or right on the top they're kind of climbing up the hill so we're going to keep these dark too at least until we remove some of these features honestly the underpainting i might just We'll, we'll come back through and we'll do some, we'll do a little bit of subtractive stuff for these edges here after we get these dark ones uh, blocked in. Maybe, that's what I'm planning right now. I'm just being conscious of most of these trees being perpendicular to the horizon which you know we can't see the horizon but it's implied by all the shapes and the trees imply the horizon your eyes estimate what the even though they're not all perfectly straight your eyes estimate what the horizon is so if we're doing all these vertical your brain knows the horizon is straight unless of course you have a little bit of painting with more motion and the trees are kind of wisping in a certain direction because they're either moving in the wind or they spent so many years moving in the wind. So, of course, anything I say, there's there's uh, exceptions. But I'm just mostly thinking in the context of this painting. All right, so I have a smaller brush here. Just gonna add some trunks. I'm gonna let that kind of hang out in front. Also have this cool tree that kind of out on top there. This also is just a little bit darker. So it's a little bit drier, a little less pigment in there. I'm gonna make that a 
little bit darker. That'll help it vignette. Same with out here. These will be a little bit darker too, just on the end. Not all of it, but just at the end here. And there's one that's a little bit closer right there. Sorry, I don't mean to be a, just a vocal growl right now. I'm just focused and focused in on this. We'll lighten it up a smidge too. But if we get these values right, it's really gonna help just support the final layers of paint. Whatever paint we put on top of it. We're gonna try to, of course, get the value right the first time, but having the underpainting is, it won't always show, but even when it's not showing, it's there's, there's still some transparency to the pigment as we paint, and so it's not lost. It's never totally lost unless you do multiple opaque layers. Then it's lost, or even one like strong opaque layer, then it's pretty much gone, but you can't underestimate it. So I think the values are working pretty well at this point. Just going to do some touch-ups here. Add details. Just want to make sure the darkest darks are really pushed. So like down here, nice and dark. of these trees that are darker. Speaking of which, we can kind of touch up the tops of the trees. I'm going to pull out the Q-tips and just make it not distracting. So remove any repetition, sharpen up the tops of the, the trees here. So like this is, you know, here's repetition, one, two, three, four. We don't want that. So we'll make this a little bit taller, make this wider. And then this guy's gonna peek out quite a bit right there. And then this guy's gonna be a little bit taller there. And then I'm gonna cut this guy down quite a bit. So for, the, uh, for this tree, just using uh, some horizontal strokes, nothing fancy, just really loose. Um, it all brightens up on the right side for these trees too. So I'm going to take a paper towel and kind of brighten up the sides of these groups of trees and simplify it. And then kind of 
push in some darker detail back into these. Just like where the branches kind of reach out underneath. You can also get a little bit brighter on this side too. It's not going to make too much sense if we're rendering out all the details right now. Just want to get major groups. that the values are working you know actually we, uh, I take back what I said earlier <laughs> I've changed my mind at this point after this underpainting we're actually just gonna let it dry and then we'll um, we'll continue on to full color tomorrow so we'll keep it a little bit shorter tonight I'll just do the underpainting because I, I feel happy with the values here and Giving it a day does really, really help because it gives me time to think about it in between. Uh, when I first started this channel, I was like, and you know, up until recently, I was like really fully like, go, 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 Ala Prima. And you know, I, it's just because I was really trying to adopt and follow a specific methodology to get better at painting. And Ala Primo is a great way to do that because every time you sat down, you, you force yourself to finish a new painting. You know, what What better way? Like, if you know within two hours you have a successful painting or not, that's a great way to be able to iterate and get better. And so uh, that's kind of the process I followed for a while. And I had done multi-layer painting, but just not as much of it once we started like streaming and I was doing a lot of portrait paintings. So by multi-layered i mean i would let stuff dry in between layers i wouldn't be strictly al prima or forcing myself to do one session um but in any case i'm now back to being more open to multi-session painting and that's what's going to be happening with this i'm gonna i'm gonna wait another day before we start blocking in full color and that's going to give me time to really get my mind off of it. Also, you know, spot like little things here and there. And I can adjust or like I, you know, would want to do for the next layer. Okay, this is going to be darker at the bottom, lighter at the top. So right now it's really soupy, you know, with the underpainting and I'm mostly focused on large value groups and just removing some distractions here. But for the most part, it's, um, I'm feeling like I need that day break. That's what I'm saying. I think it would be useful for this painting. It would be useful for the success of this painting to make it even better. that kind of peek in like that. All right, so while there's not as much on this brush, I'm gonna kind of get this area in a little bit. Keeping it not too dark. We reserve the darkest values for this bottom area, the area closest to us, where we have the brightest or the strongest value range, the brightest and the darkest. As it goes farther away, all of this behind is farther away and it's less saturated and way more in the middle, value wise and color wise. I'm going to just lightly touch some stuff with this Q-tip to pick up values or to 
pick up pigment to make it brighter in value. Basically like an eraser at this point since it's so wet. Of course all this is darker underneath here. Shadows. Anywhere that this peeks through is bright at the top like that. of the scene, I'd say. Get some of these trees back here. This group right here. This little guy that comes down like that. And since we're focusing on values, even though we don't have color yet, we, we can kind of see what's going on with the painting, depth-wise, even without using any color yet. some branches here very roughly as we've been doing the q-tip will help us do that um, you know some values will shift like right in the middle of these scratches like to almost white but it doesn't really matter from a bird's eye view especially since this is the underpainting we won't be seeing most of it but we want to just get the rough, the rough general idea and feel set ourselves up for success on the second layer. tomorrow this might honestly be a two or like a three or four session might focus on like one section at a time maybe do the hill first and then other sections as we go on This is all a bit darker right here. Down here, kind of gradiates up to a lighter tone. There's some movement that we want to include. Sorry for saying it like that, movement. really 
pull it back to the brightest white on some of these peaks here at the top. Fix up that part of the hill there. That can't be totally fixed, unfortunately. Looks like. Even that out a bit. darker here at the bottom for all of this. Vertical, then horizontal, and then using my fingers. Make sure this is dark here too. Dropped a Q-tip there. All right. Got the general idea there. Let me use a paper towel to fix up the top of this hill. I need to use a little bit of Gamsol. Just to get this part here. A little bit of Gamsol on there. this now that we've made that brighter. Get to the top of this hill right here. There we go. Nice. Nice. All right. That's a good underpainting, I'd say. We don't want to go too crazy on it. Um, that being said, we've been streaming for one hour exactly. No intro, no breaks. I have to make a decision right now, and I'm going to err on the side of caution and decide that we are going to continue this tomorrow. So we will do the second layer. We'll start laying in color and mixing tomorrow. So if you've been watching this far, I really appreciate it. Uh, if you're watching live or if you uh, catch this in the future, if you're not subscribed, consider doing so if you enjoy the content. Uh, also like the video if you if you enjoyed this uh, process of getting this first layer of this landscape done. I will be continuing this. If you're subscribed, you will be notified on your subscription feed. And a lot of times it really pushes it to your home feed, but not always. In any case, you'll know when I go live, if you're on YouTube, if you subscribe to this channel, and I really appreciate you being here. Oh, hey, here you go. Said nice. All right, sweet. Thanks for joining. All right, so yeah, I'll be back tomorrow, uh, same time, 8:30 Eastern. Uh, thanks again for watching. We'll be doing full color tomorrow. Have a great night. <laughs>